All right. Hello, everybody. I think I'm going to be live now. I'm going to just do some uh, sharing of the stream link in case anybody wants to follow along. Um, and uh, let's just tweet a message to say that I'm starting. Put a few notes in the Telegram channel. And in the um, uh, other chat channel, I forget what it's called, Revolt. And um, hello everybody, I hope you're all doing well. I'm on a Sunday evening, I've got a few hours of time to play with, so I thought I've just come back from Phosphor G and I got this beautiful book from Hans van der Quast. Uh, called QGIS uh, for hydrological modeling and um, I thought I would do like a speed run try and do the whole book if I can I don't know how far I'll get I've never done this before no idea what I'm doing um, so as the usual caveat supplied that this might all just go terribly terribly wrong but we'll try our best to give you guys some entertaining <laughs> time as I try to speed run through this I also have not asked Hans's permission. I am assuming he won't mind if I do this, but um, uh, I would say that um, what I'm going to show you here is not intended to be a substitute for buying his book. His book is amazing and um, he's put a lot of work into it, a lot of time, and his book also supports Skugis and other good causes, which he explains about elsewhere on YouTube. So. Uh, please do buy his book and um, do it properly. I'm going to be skipping through big important parts, no doubt, as I try to speed run through the book. And so, um, you know, it's no substitute for actually doing it with the book. So um, let me bring up, um, yeah, I think I've got the book on the screen here. So you should be able to see... Um, I'm on the page for Locate Press, which is an open publishing platform. When I say open, they, they publish mainly open and open GIS-based uh, content, and it's also run by members from the open source community. Um, previously, it was being run by Gary, but I think he's handed the reins back to um, Tyler Mitchell, so who's both of the, who are long-standing members of the open source GIS community. So. Um, it's a really nice initiative and the books, um, I bought two books at Phosphor G 2022 which just finished now in Florence in Italy. Um, I bought this hydrological applications one which I'm going to try to speed run through now and I bought Kurt Menke's book on Discover QGIS 3 um, which I'll maybe uh, try to do a speed run of, it's a bit thicker, so maybe it might need a few sessions and, uh, you know, not just in one go. Um, so this book that we're looking at here, you can buy it online on Amazon uh, as, a, as a dead tree copy or as a PDF. Um, I believe in speaking with... Um, with Hans that the profit and uh, as well as the environmental sustainability is better if you buy the PDF version so don't be a jerk like me and buy the, the dead tree one if you only need the PDF. Um, that said I wanted to start a collection of QGIS books because I don't have any QGIS books. I wanted to start a collection and um, be able to look at them on my shelf. Um, so that's enough waffle you don't want to hear me waffle you want to see me speed run through the book and um i have never been through the book before i've never done the exercises i'm not prepared in any way um to um you know that i that i would like uh, downloaded the, da the data for example or um uh you know trial run at first so it's speed run absolutely raw um and if you're going to do a similar exercise, then maybe um, it would be interesting to see if you do the same thing. Um, I will just mention before I start that I am in uh, chat here. So um, I'm on this, the stream chat. I'm on uh, Telegram, YouTube, uh, uh, QGIS community, and I'm on the Revolt chat. 
it's probably going to be a bit hard for me to keep an eye on all of them so I think by preference if you can put your comments into the stream chat um, that would be better for me because I'm going to keep that running to make sure that my stream is running as well also I'm, I'm, I'm waffling again I know but I'll get started in a second I am doing this from home on my as I call it my Elon Musk internet connection my Starlink internet connection and um, it's pretty good but I don't know how good it will be to provide a consistent stream so uh, let's get going I'm gonna use uh, just whichever queue just comes up uh, first let's hope it's 3.26 okay no let's not use that one that's a bit old um, oh that's actually not old it's still LTR but let's see if we can get queue just 3.26 here Mm, yeah, I think I'll use that, and uh, if I run into some issue or something, or if the instructions tell me to do otherwise, I'll try and switch to a different version. All right, and I'm going to maybe just um, disable some plugins here before I get started as well, just to, I don't want to interfere with his, um, uh, with his work. I know that I'm going to need this PC raster, but I think I might have to come back and have some do some configurations for that so I'm just going to really just uh, try to turn off as much as possible here to keep things not too confusing and if, they, if the instructions give me any um, notes on installing things I'll do that I'll also maybe just close down some of this extra stuff here to so keep things simple and uh, again I'll add things in if the instructions demand it okay so there we go relatively clean set up and um, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna not read everything aloud obviously I don't want to like just basically read out a, a, a digital version of Hans's book so uh, and, and I am like <laughs> I just did a, one of these funny online tests the other day for ADD and said like I'm off the off the rocker end off the end of the chart for <laughs> for ADD so I don't have the the um, concentration to sit and just like read through every single line here and so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to basically go through it and scan the, the like speed read the text as I would normally do um, and get to the interesting bits. So the first part I see that they're sending me to this place uh, to download the, um, the data. So I'm going to go back in my browser here and just uh, uh, try and get hold of that. Now um, I, I don't know if the link for that is public or not so that might be an issue. Maybe I'll just take this off the screen have the data off screen um, I would presume it I mean I presume it's all open data but um, and I think all of this is covered also in Hans's like step-by-step -step walkthrough on his own YouTube channel so but just to be safe I'm gonna um, just sort of get it down offline quickly just give me one second while I do that um, Hans, if, if he may even come and join the session, if he's floating around, I don't know what his plans are tonight. I didn't announce this beforehand or anything. But he might come along and say that uh, it's fine. I can just um, show everything publicly. Okay, so... Um, uh, okay. I'm downloading a big zip file, 60, well not big, it's 65 megabytes, so it's actually not big at all, and that's going to land up um, somewhere in my file system, so I'm just going to make a nice folder for that somewhere, and then I'll share the screen of that as well. Um, I think it's downloaded already. Okay, so what I got when I downloaded is this. I'm going to just quickly even though I'm going to follow the book, I'm just going to quickly orientate myself. I see, okay, he's nicely organized the data in chapters. That's awesome. And then each one's going to have some goodies in it. Um, some spreadsheets and uh, some different TIFF files. I can use my quick preview <laughs> on my Linux to see if there's anything. I can't really make out much from those. They probably need to be open in QGIS. Um, and then there's some shape files and some height maps here terrain data and then you can see some catchment polygons and a geo package so it's going to give us a bit of a tour of using all sorts of different formats which is great uh, and then somewhere in chapter 7 we can have a map composition so 
that already gives me a sense of where we're going with the book. That's awesome. So I'm going to just uh, flip over to uh, through the first couple of pages. So um, the first thing he's talking about is going to show me how to scan and map and georeference. That's going to be fun. So um, uh, again, I'm just uh, going to start with uh, georeference uh, according to the notes. So let's go and open uh, the georeference. So raster. Um, Now, um, let's have a quick look here. Um, now, I think that uh, georeferencer is not showing on this list here. And I want to say maybe I'll skip this step. Um, so, in his in here's one, it's sort of right after a line rasters, but I don't see it there. So let's just check it. I don't think your reference is not a plugin, so it should be here. Um, why don't I see them on menu? Let's have a look in the quick search here. Geo -ref mm, and I'm going to just keep the chat visible here because probably if anybody's there, there might be. Um, Give me some helpful hints by this stage. I know. Hi, Alex. Maybe you there. <laughs> maybe you can uh, tell me in the chat why don't I see the georeference in my raster menu? Um, did it move in 3.26? I don't remember. Um, anyway, I'm going to just work through the menus quickly, looking for it here. Um, It's quite funny because I actually used it just uh, a couple of weeks ago to do something. So it's not there, it's not there. Let's see if it's a core plugin. Maybe it's a core plugin. Um, or maybe the Linux build is missing it for some reason. Uh, let's go under all. Different thing that one there. So let me see quickly from the start. Q to desktop from the main menu, choose raster, georeferencer, and he's got a screenshot there. It should already be there. Let's see if I missed anything to get it. Um, let's go back and look on the other version of Q just that I had open. I have on my desktop, so let's go here. 3.22 long term release. Um, okay, so we have the georeference there. So for some reason, in my LTR version, it moved somewhere and I didn't realize that it moved. Um, now, the problem with this one is I think it's this is the flat pack or something, so I might get some other issues with this. But anyway, okay, good. I found the georeference in a different version. So, uh, so that's the first tip we can give if some instruction is not working for you, maybe check if it's something that changed in the version of QGIS you have. Um, so let's go back to the georeferencer, raster georeferencer. And I'm sorry now this is in dark theme, which I know sometimes makes it a bit harder to see on uh, when we stream. But anyway, okay, so then the next instruction is to open the raster button. Uh, and I'm going to go and find this, uh, uh, sorry, this folder here. Yeah, and it says no doubt go to chapter one. Let's see, I don't know, blah blah blah. Browse to the Mount Marcy New York USGS, which is this one over here. So we grab that and that arrives in our QGIS, which is great. Um, we're gonna go, obviously gonna go through a workflow now, like clicking some points around the map, putting in their coordinates. We'll see them in the ground control points, GCP table here, and then um, uh, uh, the end result is going to be that we can be able to see this scanned map on our, in our GIS and overlay geospatial data on top of it, which is going to be great. So, uh, first we're going to do some transformation settings. So, we go to settings, 
transformation settings and um, then we say what, what do they want us to do yeah you can choose different transformation types simple linear can be used if the map is not too much deformed um, and okay so we'll start with linear transformation let's say so let's do linear transformation uh, and then the resampling method it says um, uh, we should use um, if you need the pixel values uh, in first further calculations do it best to choose the nearest neighbor option this resampling method will preserve as much as possible the original pixel values by choosing the nearest one Visually, however, this uh, results in a blocky map. If the purpose is only for visual use, for example, as a backup for digitization vector layers, then it's better to choose another resampling method. Here we're going to choose the cubic one. So cubic um, convolution, I doubt it. And, um, and then it says the target uh, SRS, a special reference system. And here we're going to be doing 26718, which I guess is the local coordinate reference system for... Um, uh, New York somewhere, 26718, so there, 26718, I always like to double check everything I type in, 26718, just in case I um, make a mistake and then I end up um, putting the wrong option in. Now it says browse to the folder where you want to save the georeference map file using the, the ellipsis button, the three dots, and um, uh, I'm going to just stick it in the same folder where the original was, so um, that would be fine. Um, and here we're going to call um, georeferenced map, something like that. Um, all right, and then um, now it says it should look like figure 1.3 on the following page. Okay. Um, so the rest of the things we're taking as default pretty much. So let's see if he's done any other options there. He's not generating a PDF map or report. Okay, so good. So that's the digitizing options. And then he says now I'm going to start adding some ground point, uh, control points, which is the fun part. Um, and the easiest way is to use the coordinate grid on the scanned map. So if we just uh, zoom in a bit, you see it's got this... Uh, uh, these coordinates here, 48 degrees, 85 minutes, I guess, or it could be in meters, I don't know. It's a little bit hard to read them. No, those are degrees. So, um, I don't know quite what those are saying there. I think those are, um, um, those are in feet. The corners have got it in degrees. Anyway, no doubt going to tell us what's going on because I think we've got two different um, graticals overlaid on here. So one is about feet and one is about um, positions. If we just look at the corners though, we could probably just digitize the corners and we'll be halfway there. Let's see what they want us to do. Um, so use the reference, use a reference map on the cutest map canvas that has been already georeferenced. There's one way, um, or we can uh, read it off the map. Um, um, or we can use GCPs which we prepared in the field, for example, using a GPS. So we're going to use a coordinate grid, and so we're going to zoom in on the node with the coordinate 58100 and 48500. So uh, let's see. Where is that? So there's 55, 
58100. That's kind of hard to read, but it says 58100. And is that an M afterwards? East. And then, so we want to be on this line. And then, on the other side, we want to be at uh, 488500. 488. So I think we've got to go 488500. Okay, so we want to be here. And here, we want to be in this corner here. All right, and then we're going to click on the use the button to uh, the AGCP, this one over here. We're going to enable this and we're going to go click on this intersection. All right, and then we have to type in the value. Um, uh, and we have the X and Y, so it was. X was 581000, zero, 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 east, and then uh, 488-5123 for the north. And the coordinate reference system should be um, uh, 13 degrees. Like it's in degrees. That one's got an extra 48 degrees, 85. This doesn't make sense, does it? So, unless it's digital uh, decimal degrees, let me read carefully what they want us to do here. So, zoom into the node of the coordinate of 581000 and 485000, and then um, uh, uh, click and add a point into the x, y, z in the coordinate uh, x, y in the coordinate ok, and then he's pointing to a figure on the next page, so I just need to look on the next page to see, ok, and there he's chosen the UTM zone again that we used just now that makes more sense, right, so I was kind of wary of those because I thought I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be unpacking as decimal degrees or what it was doing, but Makes much more sense if it's in two six seven one eight now. Why didn't Q just remember that was the last one I used? Um, and now we're going to check. So we're in North American datum, UTM zone eighteen north. That's the same as in the book. Cool. All right. So that's my first GCP collected. Bonk. And you see, there's a little red dot. It's not so easy to see on the screen, um, but we can. Zoom in a little bit like this. I hope it works on the stream. Yeah, and you can see we have a red. Yeah, no, that doesn't work for the stream. I don't think. Anyway, we have a red dot here in the center. Um, all right. So now they're probably going to tell us to do that a whole bunch more times because we want to probably get four or five or six. I don't know how many points they want us to get. Um, so the the red the red dot is the location you've referenced in the table below the map you'll see the source x and y coordinates so there's the source x and y as um, pixel of uh, you know, pixel coordinates I think and then these are the destination in um, I guess these are now decimal degrees all right or uh, I know what what coordinate system that is in looks like decimal degrees. All right. Um, okay. Um, so let's choose a second GCP in the upper right of the map using the same method we used. The new screen should look like figure 1.6 on the next page. And um, so we're going to go and choose another one. And this time we're going to do uh, somewhere, uh, um, somewhere over here. So now we know the, the process, we can just kind of find two coordinates here, like, um, what did we have last time? We had a red dot, was that 581000, and then 5685000, 5, 
is my eyesight is not great so that's a bit hard for me to read but anyway let's see so if we can find we know that that line is going to be this same all the way across we just need to figure out what the interval is over to this side but this one has got a um, a number here but I'm just a bit confused if this is part of that number or if that's something else because I think it might be something else. So let's see there they've abbreviated 4886 but on this side I'm just sort of trying to see the logic of the graticule how they've done the abbreviations. So let's go here quickly. This side 488 uh, 4685 and then they've got three zeros. So I think they're just like taken off the extra zeros for brevity's sake up here. So we can uh, use 4685 over there on that side, because that's going to be the same, and then three zeros. 4685, well it's really hard to see if that's an 8 or a 6. Um, and then from the one on the top we're just going to add in three zeros as well. So if this says 599, nine, we're just going to add three zeros to this little dot over here. So let's do it so that we can try to see um, that says 4885 over here. So I think once that dialog pops up we won't be able to go back and look at the graticule. So that's going to be 599000 zero, zero, zero over here. So um, 599000 zero, zero, zero. and then here we're going to take it off here which is going to be 4885 assuming I'm reading that properly and then zero, zero, zero. But now I just want to check because yeah that's on the same line as before so it should be exactly the same. Um, and then it's kept the datum, so we don't have to remember any of that stuff from before. And we get our second dot. That is a smidge off from the center, it looks like, but it should be fine. So that's our second point in. And then I'm guessing they're going to ask us to just do um, some more of those. It says we should see some error statistics. So um, with only two points, um, uh, it doesn't much make much sense to look at the stats yet. So um, the error statistics is um, let's see what we've got here. Mean error zero, rotation zero. So yeah, it's not really enough uh, ground control points yet. Okay. Um, so the minimum amount of GCPs we need for linear translation should be three, and more. The more we have, the more uh, the better it's going to transform, basically. Um, so we're going to add a couple of more GCPs in the lower left and so on. So let's go back to here. And uh, we've got the formula. We basically just add three zeros onto every one of these readings here. If we can make out the, the text, so I'm going to go here. I'll kind of see if I can zoom in, click it more accurately. And then see, ah, uh, great, it lets me zoom out while I do that. Okay, so for the east, it's going to be this reading of the bottom here. Uh, um, oh, that's a bit weird because that green dot moved to an up end. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah. Okay, so that's a bit of a gotcha. So let's cancel there. It's been so long since I did any serious digitizing uh, or, or georeferencing. It's quite fun to relearn it again. So, okay, there we go. Uh, so, we're going to do 4873000 and we're going to do um, uh, 581000. Uh, I've got that the wrong way around. This one is great to have you know, somebody sitting with you while you're doing this stuff and they tell you, hey, you clicked on the wrong thing. 581, when you're alone, you just have to double check your work a lot more, right? So that's 581 is the east, 4873 is the north-south, okay? So that's stuck into there. 
we're getting a bit of an error um, report now, so that's good. Um, as the book said, we need at least three points. So here, we'll get a fourth point, and it should make things even more neatly organized. So we've got 4873 on the uh, north, 4873123, and on the um, east-west, we've got 59900. It's the same as the one that we did in the beginning because we're on the same, I think we're on the same line um, as the first one that we did. 599000 4873 4873 and then 000 and then we go. Let's see how many they want us to do. So we've done four now. We can see our error is 2.5 um, and uh, it says reduce errors and perf uh, perform uh, the trans transformation. At the bottom of the screen you can see the estimated mean error. In their case, uh, it was 41 pixels, um, which is quite a big jump. Now mine is more or less 2 pixels out, so it's probably not so bad. Um, this error is uh, also visu visualized on the GCPs using a red line. So mine is so small, you'd have to zoom in a bit, but if you go like this, you can see this little red line shows that it's sort of like uh, shifted from where it algorithm thinks it should be, if we go to the other one, um, there's also a tiny little red line of a couple of pixels. So what is going to be considered acceptable, let's have a look, um, uh, there's two ways to reduce the error, you can move the GCP um, or you can um, change the transformation type, alright, so, uh, or you could do both I guess. Here we're going to we're going to change the transformation type so that um, once we've checked the GCP, so I can see here this GCP is not so great. So I'm actually going to shift things around a bit. So I'm going to use this option here to go and move the GCPs. I have to figure out how to get that to work. Maybe I have to select it first. Maybe I should just follow the notes, right? So it says in the menu go to settings. Um, oh, it says we can try the other one. So, so they don't actually tell us how to move the. Uh, you can use the move GCP button to place GCPs ready at the nodes where the grids cross. If you select, uh, zoom in to select the right pixel. Um, you need to zoom in to select the right pixel. Um, note that the mean error is not automatically updated. You need to try and change the transformation type something else and then back. It sounds like a, a bug needed to happen in uh, bug queue. Um, I know Niall did a whole bunch of rewrites on the on the georeferencer. Hey Anita. And uh, maybe that's why the georeferencer in 3.26 is gone. So the so question I have here is, okay there I was able to move the point so that one I've updated and then we're going to go back out again and just check each of our GCPs and now uh, which one is the one on the cross section it looks like it should go a little bit more this way if anything and then we'll go back out again uh, yeah. uh, we must do your book next <laughs> as well Anita if you, wouldn't, if you don't mind us doing that um, Anita's got an awesome book on cartography, which would be great material to do here as well. Um, Alright, and that one looks pretty, I mean I could move it a smidge over, but it's in the pixel. I put it right in the middle of the pixel. So, I've uh, fixed the placement as best as I can, and Hans's notes say that I need to change the, uh, the transformation type, and then I guess go and change it back again. So we're going to just do that, put it back to linear, and we can see the mean error is updated now, it's still around 2 pixels, I think it wasn't too bad um, from the start, but if you were a bit heavy handed with your digitizing you might have had a much bigger um, uh, um, error. So, okay, um, 
he's also suggesting to try to do first order um, first order polynomial as the, the transform type. Let's see polynomial one. Let's see. And he said, oh, my my mean error actually increased. He said his um, might have went uh, gone down. Yeah, in his case, it went to a fraction of a picture, pixel. If you don't see a mean error less than one pixel, you have to check the GCP locations and correct them. But I think mine are pretty spot on. Let's have a look. I mean, that is... Move that a tiny bit again. But that is as close as you get to the middle of that pixel. Let's try this one here. Uh, this one's a bit more tricky because it's hard to see where the line is. And this one could move a tiny little bit over, but really, I wouldn't move it much. And then the last one here. like he's going to use polynomial for his um, actual uh, georeferencing, but I just want to reread. So it says, if the first option doesn't reduce the error, we can change the transformation type. If we change to another transformation type in the transformation settings, the error values will be recalculated, which we've seen already. And the other one he said, if you want to just move them around, you need to change the transformation type to something else and then back, which we did. So when I go back to linear, I still have an error of two point something pixels. Um, and when I go to polynomial one, I'm still getting an error around that. So I don't think there's much more I can do. I've done my best. Um, oh, I, sh I didn't read that carefully. So it says a mean error of less than one pixel cannot always be achieved. The decision to accept a certain accuracy depends on the purpose of the map. So I'm going to make some executive decision here to accept um, more than one pixel. So now we can start georeferencing the map. Um, so we're going to click on that and magic's going to happen. Um, and we're supposed to see a pop-up appearing. I don't see, maybe it went behind. To the book, we're going to see a pop up. We didn't get a pop up. Why didn't we get a pop up? I'm just going to go here and save my project. I don't like using QGIS for too long without saving my project because sometimes bad things happen and crashes. So I'll just call this chapter one, this project. All right. Back to here. So why didn't we get a pop-up? You said that in the book we'll get a pop-up at the end, and it's supposed to look like the Gordon reference system dialog. Um, but I just wonder, because um, the pop-up is asking about some um, which UTM zone. Um, Version we want to use, and it could be that I've already sorted that out in uh, my QGIS because I've been, you know, done various configuration things. I can see it's written something out to to disk. So I think it's actually run, and the, my, in my case, I just didn't get that multiple transforms dialog that he's talking about. Um, in this book, we'll always use the default, so anyway, that's fine. And then the georeference map appears on the QGIS map canvas, which it again didn't for me, but I think I think we're good to go here. I'm going to go back to the main canvas and um, stick that on there and uh, let's see if it shows. Let's put the um, open street map on the background. I know I'm going totally off script, but let's just see if that looks like it matches the world anyway. At, at least in the world somewhere because it's you know the map is showing over it and um, let's see if anything looks a little bit familiar here so we could maybe just um, 
there's this nice little um, widget thing we can add here to put an opacity slider in the widget so that will help me to just sort of see what's going on in the background so there's a lake there and a lake on the map look over here so that's looking pretty darn good I think we're in the same same place on earth which is great news there's uh, Orzabal Lake that's uh, we're looking at OpenStreetMap it says Lower Orzabal Lake and then here we're looking on the scan and it says Lower Orzabal Lake so that looks amazing I feel a great sense of achievement for, <laughs> for having done that. I had a few little issues, but I think it was just because my QGIS version is different. And I think the I remember reading in the change log and uh, my uh, that Niall did a huge ov uh, overhaul of the georeferencer, and it's probably moved somewhere where I don't know where it's moved to. Um, Okay, so the rest of the chapter is saying you can close the georeferencer window, which we'll do. Um, it's really nice when you have a book like this and you get like a, uh, you know, like immediate first thing that you uh, feel successful about. So I do feel successful having got that far. I'm going to save my GC points because it asked me do I want to save them and why wouldn't I want to save them? And I might wouldn't have to do all that work again. So I'm just going to call it GCP, which is going to be gcp.gcp .gcp in my file system, which will be fun to remember why I did that later. We can close the geo, um, geo reference, you can close the GCPs. It says discard, but I have to, or, or it says you can if you want to, or you can save them. Um, now we're going to verify. Now I think I've already done this. So he says, let's see, let's speed read through. So right click on the grid node or the map canvas to display the coordinates. Ah, okay, so he's verifying in a different way. So we can see um, the coordinates in two different coordinate reference systems. So let's put it into the same. Um, let's see what. Well, let's see what happens first. Uh, maybe um, I skipped a step here, and we were supposed to do this. But if we go to this corner here, we've got some coordinates in uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, and if I click here. Okay, now I'm on <laughs> now I'm on 3.22, which is the LTR version, and that does not have uh, the right-click context menu. So um, in the instructions, they're saying to use it. So there was probably something in the beginning of the book saying which version of QGIS to use, and I probably totally skipped that part. Let's have a look quickly. Um, uh, let's see what they say. I don't actually know if it says in the beginning which version of QGIS to, to use. On the cover it says 3.22 3 plus, but I'm going to guess that maybe um, it's using some newer feature here for the right click. Because if I let me open the same project in QGIS 3.26. And um, I'll just go and save it here quickly. If I open the same project here, and I right click on that spot here, you see we get this nice little menu here. So that's what the book's asking me to do is look at this menu. I guess they want you to put it in that same North American datum. So there was that. Um, See what it was in uh, two six seven one eight two six seven one eight. All right. So if we put the map into that coordinate reference system, there's that pop up that you was talking about earlier, which we're going to just accept that. And if I if I right click on here now and say coordinate, so in the book they show some sort of screenshot like this, um, and I can see the North American datum coordinate for that place, and I can see the um, uh, 4326 version of that. And then if we look at the coordinates here, they um, they should pretty much match this. So now this is in decimal degrees, so it's not 100% easy to to you know confirm that they're the same thing. But looks um, like we're all good there. 
All right, so um, and you mentioned some other uh, ways to verify is to use a map backdrop, which is exactly what I did. He uses a Google satellite from the quick map services, but I used uh, OpenStreetMap, and then he goes on later to say doing that. So I think we're all good. We've got we've got all of that um, set up. I will note that in the book he suggests to use the quick map services, so let's just go and enable that. Um, but um, quick map services. Um, I don't know. Okay, so that might answer my question. I was going to say I was going to say that it's been some of the option functionality has been pulled from the map store uh, from the plugins repository by Alex Brew. He is who is in the Ukraine under siege from Russian invasion right now and he um, as sort of a protest he pulled the quick map services from the um, from the store from the plugin repository so if you're reading the book uh, you may want to just use the OpenStreetMap XYZ approach like I did because you're probably not going to be able to follow that workflow through I'm just going to just double check that I'm actually okay. So you can still get the plugin, but I think what he did is when you go to the steps that they tell you here, which is uh, web quick map services, and then there's an option here settings, and then you go more services uh, and click on here. I think you're going to get to a broken. Uh, maybe okay. Maybe he took his protest message down again. Um, let's go and have a look. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Alex Brewery, for sharing your work and um, doing so under very difficult circumstances. No, so everything in the book is good. You can follow the book exactly as it is. Um, now he's saying we should change the... Uh, so he did some comparison using blending modes. Uh, so that we could just quickly try as well, just for fun. So I used the opacity slider, which is a nice little tip as well here. But um, uh, we can also... Hey, Niall, how's it going? Um, <coughs> Niall, maybe you can tell us if you're watching the chat where how to get the new... Uh, Georeference are working because I was trying to follow Hans's tutorial, but the Georeference is gone from the menu. Yeah, I'm using. I think I'm using the. Um, I can't remember if I'm using a flat pack here or what I'm using. Um, this is in 3.26. Okay, so we're going to just try this blending mode trip out that um, that Hans proposed. So here in the the rest of the properties. Um, we've got blending modes, and he suggested to use overlay mode. So, um, blending modes are obviously awesome stuff. They let you sort of like let the light pass from one layer um, uh, through another, but still see the see both layers together. So now we can see the two things sort of blended onto each other, and we look for some of those things like we saw before like that lake and so on, and we can sort of see that they pretty coincident. Ah, uh, Niall saying we need to look under the layer menu. Um, Georeferencer, okay, that's awesome. I guess he's going to explain, um, okay, he's explaining in the chat that it works more than just for wrestlers. Thank you so much, Niall. I was a bit flummoxed trying to follow the tutorial <laughs> and uh, looking for that, and I tried to look for like Georeferencer in here. Um, and uh, I sort of realized we don't actually have a way to search the menus, which would be really nice if I could search like the menu entries and other parts of the user interface as well. Yeah. Or if we do have a way, maybe I didn't read carefully because um, let's just quickly look. I don't think there is anything that lets you search the menus. Doesn't look like it. Maybe there's a. <laughs> A secret option that, um, that would let us do that. Okay, so I think I can pick up my following the speed run with uh, using 
um, the 3.26 version, which is obviously going to be a lot more fun because we've got nice things like the coordinate context menu and so on. And anything more to do in this chapter, he's also showing us uh, setting the blending mode to multiply. And then um, what do we get then? Just just different ways to compare the things, right? So um, that's all good. Um, now we get to talking about digitizing vector layers from a georeference map. So um, he's saying that, that can now, this map can now be used as a backdrop for doing uh, digitizing. Um, okay, and he, he's, I think he wants us to leave um, the, let me see, he says, use this layer on the next sections. Um, Change the blending of uh, the map to back to normal, okay. Then, um, so let's go back to normal here. Dunk, okay. And then we can sort of, I uh, think, leave it on or off. It doesn't matter because it's in the background of that one. Right. Um, so in this exercise, we're going to digitize mountain tops as points, rivers as polylines, and lakes as polygons. So he wants to just let the reader get some experience in d digitizing the um, standard like uh, geometry types. Now I'm wondering why my map's still looking a bit bluish. I put it back to normal. Did I change anything else? I don't remember changing anything else. So why are we in blue mode here? Let's go and just see if I can close that and open it again. We shouldn't, okay, we got the blue there. Maybe I found something weird. It's a normal. If I put it to, what did I have? Multiply. That goes to blue, and then I went back to normal. Maybe I hadn't pressed apply. Let's just go back to normal there. I don't know. There's maybe a bug for, <laughs> for now, because I, I would expect when I go back to normal now that we don't have that blue look anymore. Um. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back there. I was saying actions in the chat. Why are you saying actions in the chat? <laughs> I have to have a look just now and see what the context was. I, I was probably rambling and he was trying to fill in the gap in my thinking there. Um, okay, so we're going to get mountain tops as points, rivers as polygons and lakes, uh, rivers as polylines and lakes as polygons. We're going to create these in a geo package, which is great. Um, and we'll have all the layers in one file, so we don't have millions of little shape file components lying around. And before we start, we're going to create a new geo package. So he's going to tell us to do it from layer, create layer, new geo package layer. Um, I would love it if there was a way that when you create a new geo package, it could also automatically land up in here because I always want to come back and look at it. So I'm going to, sorry, um, Hans, I'm going to go around a different way and I'm going to do it in here and just so that I can quickly find the geo package again later. So we're going to call it. Does it tell us what to call it? You can also use the new geo package layer button. Oh, so he's offering various ways. That's great. So he yeah, didn't think he's too worried if I did it my own way. Um, and there's a handy keyboard shortcut. Control Shift N on Windows. Does that make a new geo package layer or just a new layer? I'll have a look in a second. Um, ah, he's talking about uh, Niall saying that we can look for in the actions. Okay, I'll try that in a second now. Thank you for the tip. So, does he tell me what to call it? It says Mount Marcy. It's very funny. My ma my my wife's name is Marcel, and I call her Marcy as a pet name. So, I'm naming this after my wife in honor of her. There we go. Mount Marcy. All right, and then we're going to name this first thing uh, Peaks. Uh, we're going to capital it just there and we're going to tell it to do points. So now I'm just following the instructions. Um, no Z, no X, whatever. We're going to try and find that um, North American data to uh, 18 North. And we're going to add one attribute called elevation. 
activation. Uh, and it's going to be, no doubt, a uh, whole number. I remember when I was teaching some people in Mozambique <laughs> to use QGIS, and they were confused because we had integer, <coughs> and, um, and we had float as the options. And they were confused, like, what is this integer thing? And I and then I went and patched Q just to make it whole number. But it seems we lost the whole number again. Oh, in the notes here, it says for the type whole number. So did we lose whole number somewhere along the way? Yeah, because it looks different to what's in the screenshot in the notes. Whole number is nice for people who are not too technical and yet they don't have to explain <coughs> what an integer is. Okay, so we're going to add that to the fields list, right? Uh, and now I'm going to add another one uh, of type text, and it's going to be called the name. So great. Change it to text. Add to the fields list anymore. Uh, and then click OK. All right, OK, here we go. So the way that I did that, I've got it now in my um, in my browser, and it's easy for me to come and quickly grab data out of there. If I do the other workflow, then it doesn't make a um, a shortcut in the browse in the browser, which could be cool to have like an option to say when you create the geo package, also add it in the geo package um, list in the browser. Maybe I want to just go try out that shortcut. So he said on Windows, it was Control Shift N. And it's the same on um, on Linux. So I definitely learned something there because I've never learned that shortcut, and I probably use that a lot because I make lots of geo packages. Yeah, it would be cool to maybe there's an option here, have a checkbox to say um, add this to the browser, whatever we call these favorites, favorite uh, browser connection list, whatever it's called. All right, so that was one thing, and then um, um, Niall said I should go to look under actions. So actions confused me because I would have thought. So we put a dot and then that, and then if we put geo reference, uh, there we go, it found it. I would have thought action. Well, actions, I guess it makes sense because that. But that's um, breaking one of my mantras, which is the inner workings of the system should never be. Well, the user should never be exposed to the inner workings of the system. So I'm guessing it's called actions because of Q action, the class that's used to create the actions and the menus and what have you. Maybe we could call that menus or something rather to make it more obvious where it comes from. But I bet you now it's going to tell me in the chat now that um, that it's not only from actions it might come, or not only from the menus. Maybe it comes from also the toolbars and things like that. Let's see if he's still watching him, maybe he'll tell us. Okay. All right, so we've made a geo package. We're still tracking on with chapter one. I can see this is going to be a multi-part series <laughs> trying to follow along. If you if you want the no Tim Futzing Around version, definitely go and watch Hans's um, version. Um, okay, so we made our mountains. We're going to, we added our new field and we're going to start digitizing. Woohoo, that's another endorphin rush coming for our dear, dear reader when they, um, when they get to digitize their first point. So I'm guessing there are going to be some peaks on here. It looks like there's one there. Game's a bit hard to read. Like, how would you know what that peak is called? Let's see if there's any other peaks here. Um, Niall says exactly. So I guess he's saying exactly that it's more than just the menus. That looks like a peak name, Mount, Sk Mount Skylight, is that right? Mount Skylight. Mount Marcy, oh well we have to do... Now is that Mount Matey or Marcy? Uh, Marcy I guess, yeah, because that's the whole thing. So I'm guessing the exercise is going to have us go and digitize Mount Marcy. Yep, I can see in the list there we're going to do five peaks. Mount Skylight, Mount Redford, Mount Marcy, Mount Haystack, and Little Haystack. Okay, so let's go and do them one by one. I'm going to go and just wing it and look at the instructions if I get stuck. So we're going to do here now. Where is the peak? In South African maps, we have a little triangle for the actual peak marker. But here, on our topo maps, but here they don't have them. So 
Let me see if the notes gives us any hints. Um, no, it just says uh, digitize them. Um, um, no, I skipped a page. So I'm going to go digitize, navigate to the mountain, um, zoom, add point, and yeah. So I'm just going to choose the middle of the little topmost contour and hope that's the right spot to do. So let's go and start digitizing our peaks here. Add a new one, click over there. We're going to auto generate the ID and we're going to give it the elevation which we're going to take from there. Now that is also damn hard to read, but anyway, yeah, it says 1501, I guess, and then Mount Skylight we're doing first. Mount Skylight is a strange name for a mountain, isn't it? I wonder how old that name is. I mean, how long have skylights been around? Maybe the sky was maybe it was looking a nice color. Maybe they don't mean like a skylight, like a window in your roof. All right, so we're going to do Mount Skylight, and we'll repeat for a few other things, and they want us to also discover the, the vertex mark tool. I'm going to make my dots a bit bigger just to help you if you're following along here to see what's going on. It's one of my favorite colors here. Yeah. All right, so um, there's red dot number one. Let's go and do Mount Marcy. Now that does look like a triangle there, doesn't it? The other one didn't get a triangle. It's a triangle, another one not. Five, 1535, does it say? No, 1628, it wasn't even close. 1628. That's according to the book, which has got a table of the um, um, of, of the peaks and the elevations um, in it. Okay, I'm going to just save my work in case I make a whoops somewhere and save my project regularly. Okay, so let's go get a couple more peaks. I'm very curious about this whole triangle thing. This one doesn't get a triangle. Now, was that a triangle there on the other one? I, I'm pretty sure it had a triangle. Little, little um, Marrow, uh, uh, little Marcy. Okay, that one doesn't get it. It doesn't get a triangle. So maybe they only put the triangles if they got a trig beacon on it or something like that. Little Marcy. It's all kind of stuff you wouldn't want to waste space in your book <laughs> covering, but it's fun for, um, for us to Now that one's got an X, but it doesn't have a name. A little haystack. That one's got a name, but no um, altitude. And that one's got a name and an altitude, and I think it's in the list here so I can read. So that's 1612 meters. 1612 meters little haystack all right um and what do you say we do one more let's see how many we've got one two three four let's do one more um something down uh, maybe over on this side here hmm is this your mount? Does it say Mount Colvin? There's no terrain, no height. That one's got a peak name, but no terrain, uh, no altitude. That one's got an altitude, but no peak name. Um, I wonder how the cartographer decided who got names and elevations and who just got yeah, one or the other. So that one's got a name and an elevation, but I can't for the life of me. Does that say East Dix? East Dix? 1227? I don't know. I could try and work it out from the contours. There's 1000. What is the contour interval for those major lines? That's 160. Are 40 meter intervals or 50 meter intervals? There must be 40 meters something. Uh, so maybe that says 1227. 
Let's have a look and try that. One, two, two, seven. I'm sure the world won't come to an end if I got East Dix is elevation wrong. So, okay, cool. So I've got my peaks in, and then moving swiftly on, we're going to go and do. I'm going to do some rivers. We're looking at the attribute table, which I've already done. Let's just do it again. Uh, so that's our attribute table there. All good. And then digitizing rivers. Okay. Uh, now we're going to do line, the river lines only. Um, and we're going to... Um, we're going to bypass some of the confusion that we get from the new... Um, creating new layers in the well, in the geo package well, let's see if it will let us bypass them because normally when you do um, what's our new shortcut control shift in and I choose that geo package I'm going to go on a quick diversion here and I know Niall ex I think explained to me once there's a technical reason for this but it's still pretty hard to um, explain to people so if I go here and I say I'm going to create a new line, line string, layer, I'm going to call it rivers, rivers, and we're going to, what we're going to add, the name, uh, that's just the name, and it gives you some kind of frightening messages here, it says, um, you want to overwrite the existing um, file with a new database or add a new layer, oh, that's actually been improved, I think, from the old version, right? Because the old one just used to say overwrite, and then there was another dialog that popped up and said add a new one. If I say that, do I get another? Ah, oh, good job, Niall. That's much better. That old one was really scary. That's much better. Okay. If I go and uh, let's go do the equivalent in the old version of QGIS as our diversion and see what it asks here in 3.22. I say old version, but that's L LTTR. Uh, L LTR, so not really that old. But, um, so let's go here, I've done your shortcut, and we're going to go here, and we're going to say, let's do our, um, what is the third layer we're going to be doing? Dams, I think, or lakes. Um, lakes is the third one, yeah. So we go in here, and now we already get this first message, yeah, so says, do you want to replace this file? Oh, replacing it will overwrite its contents. That's really scary. You see, this is using, looks like the GNOME dialog as well, and the other one was a, a QGIS native one. So now it's obviously figured out a way to bypass the portal and do some amazing magic to make users feel much less uncertain. Like, so if you click replace here, you feel like you're going to just trash your whole your package, which actually you won't, because it will give you another prompt to say, we, we're going to add this in later. So good job there, Niall, man. That's great. Okay, I'm going to close this dark themed one down. But yeah, okay, so uh, let's go digitize some rivers. How many rivers do they want? Oh, we're going to do some snapping as well. So that's great. So uh, toggle editing to start adding rivers. Click on the add line feature. Um, which river do they want us to add is the question. Start digitizing from up. Uh, there's a note say always start digitizing from the upstream to downstream. That makes sense because we're going to that stores the direction in the layer. And um, if you don't do that, you're going to model your rivers running up hills, which is not going to work so well. Um, all right. So which river do they want us to capture? Is the question. Doesn't really say. So. Um, Mm -hmm. All right, he's giving some tip, uh, tips about using spacebar to pan while digitizing, which I know about, which is great. And backspace to delete the last node when digitizing. That's a good tip as well. Um, okay, so he started, uh, I've seen a screenshot, he started with Sidebrook. I'm going to find the Sidebrook River here quickly. There's something brook, 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 skylight brook, where is 
Saarbrück. Uh, is it Saarbrück or Slidebrook? Oh, it's Slidebrook, okay. I got you there. So where is the here is the upstream of the catchment and where does it go to? It's gonna go through this marshland and land up in this lake over here. I wonder how far down he wants us to go, because there it's going to White Brook. Yeah, we'll get started at one end and work our way down to the other end. So there's a cool plugin I saw that lets you do like tracing of rasters, which would be kind of fun to do now because it like sort of gives you snapping points along the raster. But I guess that's like a version, <laughs> a, like next level version of the exercise. So we're going in here, we're going to go to our, uh, let's go here to our rivers layer. Good time to save the project as well. That rivers layer, I'm going to just change the style so that it's kind of easy to see it. Let's pick something random from here. And I'm going to go to start editing the layer, add a line here. And I'm just going to do kind of a rough. Now perhaps we should have done multi-part multi um, lines because um, we're going to have several bits that make up slide brook. Okay, that's part one. Um, <coughs> So we're going to go and use our vertex editor, and I I think there was some yeah there was some suggestion to use snapping which I didn't turn on. Now I'm going to have like some issue if I don't have it on. So let me yeah, cancel that and just go turn on snapping. Here we go. So snapping, and we're going to uh, we we should snap to both vertices and uh, segments. Does that do both? Okay, we're going to do it in pixels, which is great. Um, snapping an intersection, why not? Um, Alright, so I think that's enough snapping options there. Let's try to do that again. So slide book. Cool. So those should be snapped in on each other there for sure. Um, do something fun here with our with our symbology just so that we can see the vertices nicely. Let's add another uh, marker line here to this and put some big circles on every node, but just on the, um, just on the, uh, first vertex on inner vertices, oh yeah, now I'll split those apart, so that's, there we go, so that's great, so now I can see that those two things are kind of like, nicely joined onto each other by the looks of things, which is great. Okay. All the way down to a scale to one to one so they're all looking good. Right, let's save our work and um, I'm gonna digitize this bit here. Um, And uh, maybe I'll end it 
Okay, it's slide brook, and I'm going to do this tributary coming down, or the, the main stream coming down here like this. I must say, I'm having, it's probably pretty boring to watch, but I'm having fun going through Hans's book, um, just seeing how different people explain things is often fun. It's very clearly laid out. Every time I had a question or something, I looked in the book, and uh, there was the answer for my question, which is very nice. I had that one issue with the um, instruction, which wasn't in 3.22, but um, other than that, everything's been pretty plain sailing. Where are we going to land up here? Okay, we're going to go all the way to here. Are we joining onto another river by now? Well, it's slide brook. All right, I think that's enough for that, for the exercise. Let's uh, save our work, save our project. Let's see what they want us to do next. Now, it's explaining the snapping. I already went and played around with that. Um, ah, it says, if we want all the tributaries to be a single feature, you need to dissolve features. If you're giving all tributaries, if you have given all tributaries the same name, which I did, you can dissolve them by using the vector geoprocessing tools, dissolve from the menu, and then use the button to choose the name as the dissolve field. So, um, okay, and then he wants us to save it in a new layer called Rivers Dissolved. So let's go do that. I love this um, uh, context menu thingy. What's it called? Quick quick bar here. So here we can just find the dissolve option here. We're going to do rivers. We're going to choose the dissolve field. It's going to be name. Now I hope I spell the names all exactly the same. Uh, I'm going to create a new one inside of the um, geo package. See if it gives us the scary messages. No? Okay, so I'm going to call this rivers dissolved. No, I don't like to put spaces in my, in my name, so I'm just going to... Dissolved, dissolved. Has it got two S's? Um, two S's, yeah. Alright, and um, save the results to the package. Click run. Okay, so OK. And then run. Oh, we've got a new layer now. I'm just going to keep that one side in case I did something wrong. I'm going to copy this cartography here, copy the style, paste it there, and um, we'll stop editing here. And I'll make this just blue just to make it more river like. Well, um, let's see if we make the principal color red. Oh, sorry, blue. There we go. Okay, cool. So we've got our rivers. Let's see how our river looks. It looks great. Um, what do they want us to do next? So we've even done a little bit of geo. geo Processing to get those all into a single thing. Oh, we want to probably just test to see if it came out as a single feature. So let's hide away that one. Go with the identify tool. Click on there, and we should get a single feature back called slide rook. Nice. Very nice. Did they did they ask us to do um, that? Okay, they don't show you how to... oh, That's a bit confusing. So it says go on to do to the lakes. But then there's a screenshot of rivers dissolved on the next page within the lakes chapters, which is could be nice to have that in the other chapter. I know why it's there, it's because latex, what they used to do to make the books printing go, pushed it over to the next page because there wasn't space for it. Um, 
So they show all of them dissolve, which is great. So now we're going to go on to doing some late digitizing. And uh, it says try to figure it out for yourself. That's nice. I like that. Uh, we, um, you gave us some help. You got us started. And then uh, you're sending off us off on our own to figure it out. Um, it says some of them have, line, uh, have islands that need to be removed from the lake. And it talks about how to use... Um, the digitize in a polygon thingy, what do you call um, So we, that will be fun. We'll try that out as well quickly. So I can close this dissolve thing. I don't need that anymore. Save my project. Um, I'm going to do it this way now for the lakes. So a new table. Lakes. Add a field called name. Um, it's going to be text field. Polygon. Um, I think we saved everything in WGS84. I don't think it actually. Now that I'm <laughs> thinking back, did it tell me when I made the geo package which coordinate preference system to use? It did. Now I don't know if I used the right one for the second layer, so we might have to go and reproject that. Uh, let's have a look. Here, rivers, EPSG four three two six, rivers dissolved, EPSG three four three two six. So that's not good. So let's go and just reproject, reproject layer. I'm going to take it to that North American dating one. And which layer are we reprojecting? Doesn't really. That's uh, because we're doing it in place. So we're using. We need get. When you get this pop up here, you can do things in place, or you can do it like to generate a new one. So in place is perfect. Let's just check now that I think I had the legs. Select the Let's just go to that one there. Reproject layer. Uh, all right. Does it change the layer as well? I have to go and check if that layer definition got changed. No. So that's probably not so good because we don't want to reproject them and then have them in a different coordinate reference system inside layer that advertises itself as being at 4326. So I'm going to add a new layer quickly with the correct one and try to just fix up my um, thing. So um, rivers sold to and I'm going to align string Text. Here we're going to choose the co right coordinate reference system. All right, and make it multi-line. Okay. You know, let's see if I can just uh, grab this. Um, ooh. That one is gone. That one has gone into <laughs> into the great yonder <laughs> because um, let's go here. Let's put this one in. Rivers dissolve two. So because I reprojected those in place in a layer which was actually in four three two six, it's now basically taken those right off the planet. Um, if I can somehow select everything like that on that layer right there and then say copy and then uh, put it into this one here so 
say paste, I didn't get anything. Let's try to do it on the table. Copy that. Paste it there. Where did it go? I think it's so out of whack now because it's like reprojecting it on the way back in. <laughs> um, and that's not going to be good at all. So I'm going to just go and take these rivers, which were the pre-merged ones, and rerun that processing tool and delete these two tables, which are a mess. Absolute chaos there. And um, go back and recreate that one again. So I'm going to just delete these out the, um, out the database as well. Okay, and then we're going to go rerun that processing tool to dissolve. Alright, and then rivers. We put in a temporary layer, then we reproject the temporary layer and we drop it in the the other database, okay, to choose the field to be name. Okay, so now we've got a new temporary layer with the dissolved rivers, and then we uh, reproject. Using this one rather, and that's going to go out to that projection system name. Coordinate reference systems, that's the dissolved run. Okay, so these are now in the right coordinate reference system. Let's see, it. we can see it on the map. I think we cannot see it on the map. Let's see. We can see it on the map. Okay, great. So then, um, uh, now we're going to take this and delete the dissolved one. We don't need that anymore. We don't need the rivers so much anymore. And try to give it the same name that we had before. So now we're going to stick this new one into the um, into our geospatial into our geo package. So we're just going to call this one dissolved. I pressed F2 there just to rename the layer. Alright, and then I'm going to drag and drop that into our Mount Marcy Geo package. Does it go in? No? Try again. There we go. Okay. And then we can add that back to the map. And now it's coming here out of the Geo package. style onto it. Turn our style to make it a bit more bluish. Alright, and I think we're good. I think we caught up to the book. I went on a little bit of a side expedition there because I forgot to, to um, set the coordinate reference system as I should have. I'm just going to change my lake style. And um, what next? So now, these rivers, I guess we don't need them. This thing, let's just double check that that's one single feature. That's great. Okay. Now we're going to do a lake. Okay, so we're going to do this lake. How are we going to do? Uh, which one does it say we must do? Uh, got any questions or suggestions as we're going feel free to look in the to type in the chat I will I do look at it while we're going okay so um, digitizing the lakes now um, does it give us we must do big Sally Brook and Slide Brook all right 
No, no, that's the other picture that's in the wrong place. Does it tell us which legs to do? Um, it doesn't really look like it's telling us which leg to make, so I'm going to do this leg that we've got. Well, maybe we should do this one because he wants us to do one with a polygon. But my river, uh, this river actually, is a still side brook? slide brook it actually looks like maybe it comes down into here so we may have to go do a bit more digitizing later if we want that to connect into here let's go and uh, do this quickly now oh, I'm going to go on a diversion again because I'm patently lazy and I want to um, um, I want to use that plugin that lets me against the raster. Uh, let's try to search for digitize. So that's the one there. Okay. So if I remember correctly with this thing we've got to do, just go to here or here. Look in this little panel here and we have to choose the layer to trace. And set a color here. Pixels to snap to. Uh, what's good distance? Smooth lines. Snap to vector layer. I don't know what the number is for that. Anyway, okay, so let's go and let's see if we can uh, no, digitize the lake. Digitize the lake by following this. So it should be kind of like um, I'm doing something wrong in a second. Better to trace your reference, yeah, map. Uh, you have to do the trace color, it has to be the color on the map that you want to get, I think. So we're going to go here and sample this. See if that works better. Is it doing some clever stuff for us? Not yet. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> this thing is not going to happen now. It it looks pretty cool when you see it on the site that it can like it would make a curve along there for example but I don't think it's working so well so either I don't know what I'm doing or it's got some bugs or it's not well suited to the thing I'm trying to do with it it's also an option okay so there was another option for doing tracing here um, see if we've got both toolbars for um, advanced digitizing and digitizing um, this one here let's see if this let me just go like to have another vector layer underneath it to follow along. It'd be great to have just like a one that lets you basically just draw pictures. Maybe we can do it by um, and if now 
file if you're listening is there a way that when I'm digitizing I can just hold down the modifier key and it will just sort of give me a vertex every uh, 20 pixels along the line or something like that sure some of you are probably using this <laughs> stream to put yourself gently to sleep while I just talk to myself using QGIS anyway. Hopefully some of you are getting some value out of it, or at least just having fun doing some QGIS nerdery by proxy through me. It's all pretty basic stuff so far, but it's still interesting. Even with the basic things, you're always learning something new, right? Yeah, I want the stream digitizing mode, but when I enable that, maybe I need to go... And when I go there and enable it, let me see... Um, that's it there, a oh, stream digitizing mode. Where do I find it? Let's try the new thing out here. Stream. Stream digitizing. There we go. So I used the new tip that Niall gave me. The dot in front. Where was the icon for that? In toolbar. Maybe we only see it when we are in edit mode. It's funny because I don't see the same icon in my toolbar. But it's there in the actions list. Let's try one more time looking here. Okay. Anyway. Did we get it now? Let's see. Oh my god, it's gone crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I want it, but I want it to work only when I'm pressing a mouse button down. Let me just see. Okay, I'm going to go back out again and just start again. Let's try and see. Okay, so it works by you just click to start. That's a bit of a challenge for me because I would like it to work when I've got my finger on the mouse button. Uh, or press, uh, hit the drop down, uh, let's see, so the button to the right of the CAD advanced dock, um, button to the right of the CAD advanced dock in the toolbar. So I'm not even looking in the right place. <laughs> okay, okay, there it is. Okay, so I had to go, yeah. I had to go down there. And then streaming tolerance, two pixels. That's going to be something I want to set, isn't it? Say like 20 pixels, something like that. And how do I make it work that it's only running when I've got my finger on the mouse button? Um, hit the drop down or press R. Uh, to the left of move features on the toolbar. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that part I got, thanks. And then um, R will turn it on and off. Okay, let's go, let's see. So, we're doing a new one. We start capturing, we're not on streaming, and then R, it's now streaming. Beautiful, ah, okay, that's so nice. New spacebar. Jeremy, I hope you're watching this. Uh, Jeremy is one of our GIS team who's been doing a lot of digitizing lately. <laughs> um, for sure this is going to make your life a lot faster. It would be great if we could do this and have that snapping plugin working. Isn't that so nice? That's a pretty intuitive way to do it. I don't have to do a lot of work at all. 
I never really needed to use this before myself, so I've never tried it out. Oh man, that's so nice. Very efficient. Thanks for all those tips there, Niall. Some mouse control issues going on here, but <laughs> I'm going to just uh, do it kind of rough. It's actually great that I don't have to hold the mouse button down. I can see why they made it so that it just works as you move the mouse because you, your finger will get tired and you have to sort of concentrate quite hard to just keep from doing any crazy wild mouse movement. Which you don't realize how often you probably do do crazy wild mouse movements. Oopsie, I'll come and tidy up those little snags later. See now he's writing some more advice in the chat. I'll have a look in a second. Ooh, okay, this would have taken me ages doing it. So I'm gonna try the R button again because I need to move my mouse a bit, so let's toggle it off. Great, so now it's not capturing. I can just like reposition my arm a bit. And then back on R. Oh wow, look how fast you can capture stuff. That's just amazing. I'm just using the spacebar to move, uh, to pan the map as we go. Spacebar was one of the earliest um, <laughs> shortcuts for digitizing that we got. We should have a, like a speed digitizing competition one day on an open day. That would be fun. See who, give them the same features to do, maybe some, how are we going to, we're going to have to check that they did it all to the same um, quality, but we could see like, we could have a reference one, which is like the best one. Oh, that was done very slowly and carefully. And then uh, time everybody, see how long they take and what percentage overlap or something there is to the reference one. Alright, getting close to the end. Woohoo! I think we're done. I've lost track totally of what <laughs> this thing is called. Second Pond. Where the first pond is, second pond. All right, that was great. I never ever used that feature before. It's such a nice feature. Everybody should know that if you're doing any digitizing. Let's see what Niles' tip is. Um, and he's saying, "Oh, this works with all the modes, like splitting, adding parts." That's good because I'm about to do an add. Uh, well, I'm going to take a part out of this. A second, this thing. Sorry, Rasta Tracer, you're you're out of here. <laughs> you didn't do the job for me, but it was a great idea. Okay, I'm going to make this uh, cartography uh, style a bit transparent so that I can see. This is probably um, oh, what's going on. Now? I'm editing the wrong layer. Lakes. a bit transparent so we can see where those holes are that we're going to get. Okay, so we've got a couple of holes to capture and I'm feeling like it's going to be really quick. I'll try just clean up some of these little gaps. Really, probably will only worry about this one. So let's go to um, this one here. But Niall said it will work with all the modes. Um, uh, 
Oh, I must watch out because it's remembered, so I must uh, press R before. Now, how can I see whether it's on or off at any time? Let's see. Now, I'm saying it's, I'm referring to the streaming mode capture. But, um, if I start, like, there's a there's the bit that allows you to add a little part on, so I think I won't actually use this one. I'll use the one. Um, yeah, this one here, yeah. reshape. Should I use that one? Or there's another one that let you go. Oh, maybe that's the one I want to use. So let's go here. I'm just going to try to. Okay, you've got to grab. Work like that. See the vertices. Okay, that one's not selected, that's the problem. Okay. Right, okay. So now let's try again with the reshape here. Yeah, and I should be able to just go like this. Maybe that R thing is now on. I used to have a tool that you could just start drawing inside and then go over then with add on. If I do this, wait. Ooh, there we've got a bit of a bit of a whoops. is why we can't just go and add a new I want to basically just draw around like that to add it on so it doesn't work and I think it should be working I think I was using the right thing but I'm going to go to this one here and just um, grab some points here like this and what I'll do is I'll just delete all the other ones Yeah, delete them. There we go. It wasn't too painful either, but it would have been nice to be able to just sort of draw around this edge a bit. There were some long debates on the QGIS mailing list about this behavior, whether you must click and drag or click and let go and drag or get all the nuances. But anyway, I think that works pretty well. So, um, I want to make this thing not selected anymore so that I can see here and then I'm going to go and cut out some holes out of here so let's go and cut this out as a hole first so add a new ring and uh, are we in streaming mode? no, and then we can hit R and Bob's your auntie we're streaming again oh Oh, 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 what happened now? That's weird. It went out of streaming mode on its own. It was streaming, 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 and then it just sort of stopped. So we're getting a lot of intersection issues there, and it's not happy. Hi, Jack. Um, did you click when trying to stream digitize with reshape? Just tried it and that seems to have done the trick for me at least. Hmm, I did click. So we're using this, uh, this one here. 
I was even trying to do it without stream. Did, let's say I want to add this bit in here. So I kind of think I should be able to start inside of here, click, 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 and then right click, and then it should like close that bit off for me. Um, so there I'm clicking. Maybe if I take it from a vertex, maybe I, I think I tried all. I tried selecting that, and then using the reshape tool, doing discrete clicks. Nope, and doing it. Oh, and then I get that exception as well. So I don't know, um, Jack. Uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong or maybe something's wrong with my copy of QGIS and it's not doing it right, I'm not sure. Alright, but um, I moved on from there. I'm gonna I was trying to capture these inner you know, rings, but that's also giving me an issue now. So let's see. Let's go in here. I'll try to do it just really simple. It's I'm getting a crash, everything's just grinding to a halt. I'm going to just disable all the toys there and then see if it can just do it simply. I, th I kind of think it's crashing. I'm getting lots of those little man er errors. I'm going to open up some potato so Excuse the loud rustling while I do that. Uh, what was that message now? Hmm. Look, you just back. Let's go back and just see. I'm just gonna like give it some therapy <laughs> by just um, going out and starting again. Oh my god! I need to give my, my shortcuts better names so I can remember which one is the uh, latest release and which one is just the LTR. Alright, we've gone out, we come back in again. Hmm, that's weird. It's also now gone and shifted my whole leg over. Pretty sure I didn't do that, but I might have done that. Just fooling around too much or something. Mm. I can shift it back like this. All right. Okay. Let's try again and make one of those rings now. Um. So add a ring. Let's do it simply without any of the stream tools enabled. You can see what a big difference using that streaming makes just in terms of getting these blocky looking things out versus a nice smooth looking polygon that we got with the streaming. Alright, that, that seemed to be working nicely. Uh, let's try the next one as the streaming one. Let's see. So here we're going to go, we can press R. Have to be in streaming. Okay, I see. So, what is the keyboard shortcut? Or just the normal one. We don't have a way to get back to the normal one. Okay, so uh, I suppose R just toggles it off again. Anyway, okay. So here comes the next one. We're starting there. And we're already in streaming mode. That is just so much easier than doing the click, click, click thing, isn't it? Um, any more holes? I was wishing there was some more now so that I could play with the streaming some more. Um, great, Jack. I'm glad you, you're learning along with me. Um, I said I've never really used it for anything before other than just reading about it in the change logs and what have you. But if 
I was doing any serious digitizing, this would be definitely something I would tell people to learn about. Because look how nice that is. Bonk. All right, so we've got all the holes. There's another one there. You know, things are going well when you're actually looking forward to doing the task rather than, you know, thinking of it as a dreary thing to do or, a, you know, like boring or what have you, repetitive. Because there you get a nice little, I don't know, endorphin dose every time you draw one of those little things. There's another one to do. Uh, oh, okay, either direction as well. All right. All right, good, that was great. Okay, so I've lost track of whether I should be doing <laughs> more than one or not in the exercise, but I'm just going to save, my, save up my work and go back and look in the book. So finally we're going to create a polygon vector layer for some lakes. I kind of feel like that river should be connecting to the lake, but I also kind of think that if I'm just like, a page ahead in the book that maybe we're just doing it more as a exercise to learn about it and then we're gonna in a new chapter get a new data set so maybe I shouldn't stress about it too much if I was doing it a bit more um, what have you particularly I would try to join those two things up all right so he goes on to do some styling talks a little bit about the ordering of the layers that you should put the polygons underneath the, the lines which should be you know, underneath the points whatever you normally um, it also reminds us about using blending modes and opacity and so on um, and of course you can um, change you know break those rules if it makes sense but they're good general guidelines all right so let's see he wants us to style the peaks and we're going to just put a uh, we're going to use a simple marker, SVG marker, and he's going to use the red marker that I made at, <laughs> I remember making this marker, it's actually not a very nice marker, I, I must say, but it's, um, let me go and do it here quickly, it's um, this red little, um, where is it? <coughs> red. Um, let's go down to the R's. So we click in here and start typing red. I just turn them into daggers. Uh, it would be nice if you've got a lot of symbols like I have that you could actually filter them somehow. Uh, maybe I should be doing this. Whatever you wish for comes true in QGIS. You just need to try things out. Okay, so, but I don't have that red marker. I wonder if that got removed. Uh, we wouldn't have removed it because it would break everybody's projects. I wonder if it got hidden away because it's not so pretty. Mm. Does that search search the collection names or does it search the... It's a bit confusing here because here you've got, a, you've got a search icon which makes you think you're going to be searching the layer, the symbol names, but then if I start typing things, I'm actually searching the symbol set names. If it says filter symbols, but let's see, let's see if we start type apps setting, oh, it actually does both, so it filters on the name of the set and on the actual symbols. Still brings begs the question where our symbol is like it's in the diagram. So the one he's got showing there is like a little traditional map marker with a shadow, which I made that as an SVG. Ah, oh, it's because we're supposed to be using SVG marker, but I'm on SVG here. Okay. So I was searching in the styles, not in the markers. Obviously, that's 
not so smart. There we go. So there's the red one. Why do we have that twice? Yeah, thanks now. Yeah, but I, what I was doing wrong is I was switching the st styles and not the SVGs. I don't know how to make that any easier than it is already. It's just me being dumb. <laughs> so <laughs> never discount that from the discussion, right? Somebody always does the wrong thing, but okay. So I found the red marker and we're going to set that to a nice big size here. So the reason I'm not 100% happy with this, I don't think it's good hard coding colors into the markers. We, I mean, I think that we did that, I did that back in 2013. I think we might have already had parameterized SVGs at the time. If we didn't then, we certainly do have now, and we should be making that something that you can change as a property, you know, change the color as a property of the icon. Maybe somebody, somebody like, um, Raymond <laughs> might have already gone and parameterized that. We could have a little look and see. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's done or not. Okay, so we've done the peaks and I'm going to put labels on them as well. Woohoo! Labels are always fun to do. Um, see if they give us any guidelines. Um, Switch to the labels tab, switch to no label, uh, from no labels to single labels, label with option of the name, done that over here. Um, <coughs> it's also possible to use multiple fields, so uh, it's going to get us to combine the old, um, ah, and on the next page there's a picture of using the SVG marker, and if I'd probably seen that on the previous page I might have skipped some of that fiddling around, or oh, probably was in the instructions. So he's going to have us make an expression to combine the peak name and the uh, altitude and the word meter. So let's see if I can just wing this. So we're going to go here, we're going to go, we've already got a name in there, and we can put in, let's search for altitude, uh, what did I call it, okay, call it fields. Elevation, we call it, and then he wants the word meters. So he has the rule for expressions. If there's one thing you must remember: it's single quotes for text, double quotes for fields, or other um, yeah fields really that, that you're trying to reference. Uh, um, and uh, then we can see. The combined but there's so we have to need another concatenator. Oh thanks Niall, thanks for joining and um <laughs> yeah I might still be here <laughs> when you come back if the book's not finished but I, well I'm not gonna finish the book tonight but yeah. Have a good one and uh, we'll catch you next time and hello Ismail Sunni how are you doing today? Uh you're saying good morning so you must be out in Indonesia. Um, so welcome to Indonesia, everybody who's waking up there. So, okay, I've made my expression. I said um, Mount Dix, whatever, East Dix, and then the, the height. I think that's what he's going for. He wanted a new line between the name of the mountain and the elevation. So let's go here, I'm going to put slash N. You can see my preview now, it says East Dix, 1,227 meters. Um, anything else he wants me to add? Right, I think that's pretty much it. So, uh, let's see how his came out. Ah, he formatted the number nicely so that... Why did he do that? So, he wanted to get rid of... Um, You want to get rid of any decimal places, but I think I did mine as an integer, so I don't have to worry about them. Here's one he did like um, format underscore number, and then you put it like this, and then you put it like that. But in my case, oh, we got some also local based formatting, so we're getting it in Portuguese. 
number styles. So that's also all right, maybe. So we'll keep that. That's great. Good one. Okay. So now we don't really see our labels yet. Uh, they are there, but they're not very easy to read. So let's go and pump up the font size a bit. Choose something a bit more bold looking. Um, and is he going to tell us how he wants them placed? Okay, set it to bold, buffers, uh, in the old buffer thing. I'm not a big fan of using buffers for the most part, but um, I think they get overused and they don't always look great. But um, that's the topic for another day. Okay, and now let's go and see if we can place that marker underneath. Um, like underneath each point, maybe offset by it's X, a little bit down below like this. Now they're going to still bump into each other, and I think I can just change the font to a smaller font, and that would help. We're losing one label here because of the label placement, not allowing collisions. So let's go change the font size to a smaller font. There we go. Good stuff. Alright, was there any other ones there? So that's not going to look great at all scales, but it looks alright like that. Let's save our project. And then we're going to style the rivers. I uh, already styled my rivers, but <laughs> not really in a cartographically useful way, but more interesting for uh, while I was playing around and digitizing and things. So we could go and get rid of this marker line and actually just disable that symbol there and that's probably um, not too bad we could disable some of these symbol layers this is nice if you've got some extra goodies here and you don't really want to get rid of them but you don't want them to show you see they're grayed out now and um, I was just drawing as a simple line okay no doubt he's going to want to style the uh, we're putting labels on the rivers too okay get to use some line following logic here. We're going to use the name. I bet he's going to want to put a buffer around it. Yeah, repeat the steps of the labeling for the peaks. So we'll do that. We're going to do the buffer here. A buffer like that. Uh, maybe make it bold as well. The bold is a bit extra. <laughs> a bit uh, much what I did on the other one, so I might go and take that off. And I like my rivers to go on um, curved like this, and then um, above or below the line, there we go. Gives them a bit of a, a nice line following thing going on there. All right, and the lake, I'll be very surprised if he doesn't ask me to do the lakes too. Um, there was probably some other bits and pieces. Uh, he's suggesting to use Calibri font. Let's see if you've got that. I don't have it. So he's, he's giving some tips about where you can go and uh, what you should do if you don't have it, which is just to choose an alternative. And now we're going to do the legs, and he's using like an, uh, I think he's going to use a shape burst, or what are we using here? Um, uh, let's set the layer styling of the legs, switching, blah, 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 change the symbol type to shape burst. Okay, no big surprise there, because that's how it looks in the, um, Preview. So let's go over here, there, change this one to shape burst, fill, and then I think we want to invert that. Um, I'm sure there's probably a more efficient way to do that that I'm not thinking of now because it's 12 o'clock at night. Um, Just make the burst a bit 
shorter, a bit something like that. Um, this blurriness, something like that. Doesn't look exactly like this, but oh, that's making it more blurry. Let's make that just a little bit smaller. There we go. All right. Um, anything else? Labeling the lake. Yep, let's label our lake. I think we've still got some transparency going on here from before. Let's go again. So let's go label that with the name. And then I think we should be able to just copy the style from our peak here. Styles, copy style, labels, and then go to here, styles, paste style, labels. Okay, and then obviously we can't use that whole expression because we don't have all that information for our lake. Right, we want different placement rules for the lake, so we want it around the centroid. And we want to tell it to be um, force the point inside the polygon. Um, there's not a thing to say force the whole label inside the polygon, which would be super nice to have because um, here yeah, it's hanging over the edge, but anyway, that's fine. He chose a white font, which makes good sense because we've got a blue background there, so let's go here and just change this to white. We've got it white, we don't need that buffer around it, so we can get rid of that. And he chose one that wasn't super bold as well, just something like that. Alright, I think we've reached the end of the chapter and that's going to be the end of the stream today. We can obviously have <laughs> Many evenings of uh, fun streaming as I go through the different um, chapters. I hope you enjoyed following along. If uh, there was something I could have done differently or better or um, slower or faster or whatever, let me know. Uh, like I said, I didn't read every single line of the thing. I just tried to follow the gist of what he was wanting. Um, Hans, if you um, have any thoughts about me <laughs> using your materials like this, please let me know. Um, um, and thanks for tuning in everybody, I will catch you on the next one, where we'll look at chapter 2, um, where we're going to 